some slight differences. Material differences happen above 30. Uh, we've seen that, I mean, and we're charging up rates can, can more than double, uh, which now does matter. I will tell you one thing, that in my client base, I have some clients who are 15, 16, 17% of net as a pay. If you can do that, they are home runs when it comes to charge off the static pool rates. I mean, they are, I mean, if you can do that, the reason that he says that rents is 25 is probably the same thing when we had our stores, uh, we just sold recently in South Georgia. If we did 20% of net pay, we'd have to sell bicycles. Uh, <laughs> so we went up to 25, but it also coincides with the fact that everything else is inexpensive compared to, say, the Dallas. It's auto max. But I will tell you one thing that is kind of interesting when it comes to, uh, yeah, to underwriting and especially payment to income. The biggest mistakes that we see made in underwriting are with repeat customers mm -hmm. because we let them buy deep. We give them 30% or 33% payment to income. Why? Because that's what we promised them, right? You buy the tourist now, pay for this, and I'll get you the Cabo next time. Well, they pay for the tourist 7 out of 10 times or 8 out of 10 times. They come back and say, hey, we're not on the Tahoe. Okay, great. We're going to put you in that $500 payment. Can you afford it? Yep, I can do it. And they fail. And we see higher losses with repeat business, about 40% uh, losses with repeat business. And that's one of the main reasons why. It's not less down. It's not a longer term. It's the fact that they keep their payments higher. They end up being a higher uh, payment to income ratio with them. I'm sure some of you, and I, I'm very guilty of that in the past. Trying to, be, trying to do good by my customer. What do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. And I would. And I probably still would to this day. If I was out there working for a living like you, I would probably treat those repeat customers just knowing that if I get them again, I got a chance to get people they know, and I would probably make that mistake again today. Still. Uh, the one other thing I want to add to that income uh, discussion is that I just recently did an on-site where fairly stunning results. Uh, they had first put in underwriting guidelines in place for the very first time, um, and they said, "Well, look, they're all they're all matching up to our underwriting guidelines. We have no exceptions on the report on the first hundred deals." And then I go in there and I say, well, let me ask you, you have a $1,200 minimum net income, which is pretty low, but okay, that's what ours is, so it's pretty low. Um, and the very first deal check that I pull up has an $850 a month take home, uh, line one, and line two is a secondary income, and this is, you can't make this up. It says $350, it's exactly $1,200, and it says, in little chicken scratch, non court order child support. Oh, well, they know. So they are $1,200. Not how to said, can you define non quarter child support? Um, we do that though, that, that's an extreme case, but sometimes we, we create incomes to make it max minimum out there. And I think you need to be really wary of that stuff because household incomes, for those of us in the collection world, we can tell exactly what happens when we took two incomes of a husband and wife together to buy the truck. And then next month on my very first phone call, and she says, Why are you calling me? That's his truck. Well, he's going to lose the truck if you all don't pay for it. He goes, So? Do you have a question? Alan, I sat in a 20 group meeting yesterday where dealers were debating how active the salespeople should be on collections to the point that zero act activity all the way. They should be there going out with the collectors just to get a feel of what's going on. I'm curious what their opinions are. Fire away. All right. Um, so, obviously, it does depend on how you're completely structured as a company. I know I have some clients who don't really have salespeople. They have associates who are in charge of underwriting, verifying, selling it, and then that will be their account uh, from that moment forward. I certainly think they should be involved. Um, I'm very, I'm very skeptical of most typical salesmen's ability to truly collect and collect the right way. Uh, and it was easy for us because all of our loans were sold directly into our, our finance company, so they're no longer owned by the car company. So the car company doesn't have any reason or right to collect that loan. Uh, you know, when a sales guy tells me that I know how to collect them, or I know these are good customers, I like to say based on the buyer. I really like to say, you know what, Mr. Salesman, if you can get that customer inside, fill out an application, I get to approve them, I'll take it from here, go get me another one. I think that's a job well done. Right? Uh, agree, and, and, and again, kind of disagree a little bit. I've seen some smaller operations owner ops where you have that kind of person that can wear two hats, but I can guarantee you it's very, very rare. Uh, my recommendation is you get the collections out of the sales division as soon as humanly possible. Just because it's hard to put on the, I'm your friend, giving you the low down payment, the car you want to next week calling you because your payment is past due. It's just too hard. And there aren't very many people that can wear that hat effectively. So uh, the quicker you can get it as its own function away from them. And most sales guys that I've talked to when I've been out of leadership don't really want to get that part of it anyway. They would rather sell the cars and be the good guy and not have to worry about being the bad guy when it comes time to not be able to